In this chapter, you will learn how your nervous system works. As you might imagine, it's not so simple. We're going to have to break down this chapter into three main components. The first component is understanding what a membrane potential is and how it comes about and how it is necessary for an action potential to occur. The second part will be about the action potential, what it is, and how it is being propagated. And the last part is going to be about synapses. That means once an action potential arrives at the end of an axon, how it is how, then uh, transmitted, how is the signal transmitted to the next cell, the effector cell or effector organ. Let's begin with a very brief review of what you should have learned in anatomy. Uh, this slide here is um, in your text, a review slide about um, the nervous system, the different parts, and organization of the nervous system. Make sure that you review that. Uh, you should definitely know that we have the central nervous system, which is composed of brain and spinal cord, and then we have the peripheral nervous system, which then has the somatic section and the um, um, the autonomic section, sympathetic and parasympathetic side, all of these will be separate lectures, but uh, please uh, take a moment to refresh your memory on the organization of the nervous system. Uh, here is a typical neuron shown. Make also sure that you are going to review that. And this will be a multipolar motor neuron, for example, that's myelinated, so we have the myelination right here, and then you have the cell body with the nucleus right here. We have multiple input areas, those are called dendrites, and one long axon right here uh, that then synapses here with the next cell. And so this will be the postsynaptic neuron with this here, the juncture being the synapse. This is the presynaptic neuron. So review that, please, um, um, if you forgot all about this. Also here is a different um, type of neuron. This is more the type of neuron that you would see in the sensory system. Same principle, though, multiple input areas, dendrites right here. Then in this case, a, in the sensory system, the, the cell body is sitting in the center and the axon extends both sides here. Uh, so the cell body right here and then the axon, myelinated axon extending on both sides. And then here we have these multiple input areas. This slide shows just different types of interneurons that you might see in the central nervous system. And again, you can review as needed. Um, here would be the typical multipolar motor neuron that we had on an earlier slide already. This slide here addresses the issue of fast versus slow axon transport. So we're taking a look at these uh, vesicles as they're pinching off from the Golgi apparatus and then they're moving through the axon. Um, they are filled up with neurotransmitter that can be released here at the axon terminals and then they will be recycled and moving through the cell. But it's not that important for us and so you can um, just review that as needed. Uh, glial cells, uh, that's the support staff in the ner nervous system. Um, typically a neuron has a support staff of about um, 10 glial cells and uh, there are different types of glial cells. Glial comes from basically the term glue, so they are like nerve glue. They are literally the support staff to a neur neuron. Um, the Schwann cells are an example of a glial cell. They form the myelin insulations, which are important for fast um, action potential transmission. And um, here are satellite cells. Um, they support the cell bodies. Here are some more glial cells shown. Astrocytes, uh, they are involved in forming the blood-brain barrier, um, deciding um, which kind of substances can get through to the brain and which ones are not allowed in. And um, oligodendrocytes, microglia, ependymal cells, uh, they are all important. Let's take a look at specifically uh, the astrocytes and how they're forming the blood-brain barrier. You see an astrocyte right here. And the foot processes right here, they're hugging this capillary, adding an extra layer through which substances must pass. And so that uh, forms the blood-brain barrier, which is important, of course. But um, let's move on. This slide here shows how Schwann cells wrap themselves in multiple layers around an axon and thereby forming these myelin insulations. So basically you can see how the cell wraps itself layers and layers of um, 
phospholipid bilayer surrounding this axon right here. You have multiple layers right here, and that will be a myelin insulation. This is what it looks like when the myelin insulation is done. You can see these multiple layers of cell membrane surrounding this axon right here, and then the spacing is very critical. We'll get back to that. Um, the spaces between each um, myelin insulation, they're called nodes of Ranvier, and these are bare spots with no myelin insulation, and the action pro uh, potential will be propagated from node of Ranvier to node of Ranvier. Now let's move on to the membrane potential. We need to first consider what the membrane potential actually is, and basically it is a differential distribution of charged particles. Now these charged particles are called ions and uh, the two ions that are most critical here to establish the membrane potential are sodium and potassium. Hopefully you got a chance to look at the video on the membrane potential that's posted in this module for this week. Uh, that's really helpful to understand the membrane potential. So let's just consider sodium and potassium ions. The sodium potassium pump will establish a very steep concentration gradient. It will tirelessly pump sodium outside of the cell and potassium on the inside of the cell. So now you have these very steep concentration gradients that establish a form of potential energy. Because if you were to open a sodium channel or, or potassium channel, well then these ions would go down their concentration gradient and release that energy. So a membrane potential is essentially potential energy that can be released in form of allowing these ions to go down their concentration gradient. Another good way of um, sort of picturing the member potential is an, an electric outlet. It works just the same, basically. You're putting, you have two prongs, and in order to allow the flow of electricity, meaning electrons to go down their concentration gradient, well, if you want to, if you have a voltage in your outlet, then uh, you can plug something in and take advantage of that energy, the flux of electrons, and power your appliance. So, but what if there's no voltage in your outlet? Then, uh, well, nothing would work. Nothing will move and there will be, you can't power anything with that. So a member potential is essentially like a outlet that's ready where you can plug something in and take advantage of the energy that's there. Now, just like in an outlet, you must have a voltage, a gradient of charged particles. And an outlet is you're putting electrons on one side and nothing on the other side, and then you have a steep concentration gradient, and you can let those ions go, or these electrons go down their concentration gradient. In the case of a membrane potential, you have charged particles that you're sorting out on both sides of a phospholipid bilayer, and when you want to, you allow pores, ion channels, to open up, and then the flux of the ions is what generates this action potential that then is uh, propagated down an axon. So let's consider how this works in living cells. We call these the membranes that carry a membrane voltage. These are called excitable membranes. Um, so how does this voltage come about? Uh, we have potassium ions in the inside of the cell, mostly, so it's high concentration of potassium. Now we have sodium ions on the outside. Both of them are positively charged, so what are we talking about here in terms of creating a membrane potential? Well, if you were to stick a voltmeter in an excitable, towards excitable membrane, you would find that it will measure about minus 70 millivolts. Minus 70 millivolts. And the reason for that is, is that yes, you have potassium ions that carry a positive charge on the inside, and yes, you have another positive charge particle, sodium, on the outside. However, you have a large amount of fixed anions inside of the cell that contribute an overall more negative charge here. And um, the amount of potassium is actually a little bit less than the amount of sodium. So overall, even though overall both sodium and potassium are positively charged, you would measure that the charge difference outside to inside or inside to outside, whichever way you want to look at it, would be minus 70 millivolts. In other words, 
compared to the outside, the interior of an excitable membrane, the cell of an excitable membrane is negatively charged. And at rest, uh, this is, it depends a little bit on the cell, but on average, it's, we're talking about minus 70 millivolts. Another good way of thinking of this uh, scenario here is um, just picture that, let's say your friend has $1,000 and you have $100, then both of you are in the positive, you both have money, but your friend has a lot more money than you, and so if you're comparing yourself to your friend and you have $900 less, so it's not that you're in a negative, but you have less money than your friend. It's kind of the same with cells. Um, sodium and potassium, yes, it is true, they're both positively charged, but take into consideration the um, fixed ions in the cell, there will be mostly proteins and DNA, um, and relatively fewer potassium ions as, as compared to sodium. The interior of the cell is negative compared to the outside. Since this is kind of an abstract concept here with the membrane potential, Let's just consider the main player separately. So what if we wanted to consider just potassium? Well, we know that potassium is at high concentration inside of the cell and very low concentration on the outside. So the gradient that you want to establish and that is being established by the sodium-potassium pump that tirelessly works, um, we have about 150 millimoles uh, in the inside concentration of potassium on the inside of the cell and only five millimoles on the outside of the cell. That's a very steep concentration gradient. Now, if you wanted to calculate um, the membrane potential just considering potassium, then you would plug that into the Nernst equation and calculate the membrane potential for potassium. Uh, that's about minus 90 millivolts, and I'll show you how that works in a sec. So based on the concentration gradients that we know exist for potassium, if you were to stick a voltmeter into a cell just considering the potassium concentration gradients, you would measure a potassium equilibrium potential of about minus 90 millivolts. And you can also calculate that based on the known concentration gradients inside to outside, you could calculate that using the Nernst equation. Let's consider sodium. Um, sodium, the vast majority is on the outside of the cell and very little on the inside of the cell. So here are the concentration um, gradients, 12 millimoles approximately on the inside and 145 millimoles on the outside. If you plug these numbers into the Nernst equation, you will find that the equilibrium potential for sodium is about minus, uh, uh, plus 66 millivolts. Here's a summary of the concentration gradients that you find in excitable membranes, cells of excitable membranes. So the sodium, 145 millimoles on the outside, and um, only 12 millimoles on the inside. So this is an important ion here for us. And then we will consider potassium. That will be 5 millimoles on the outside, 150 on the inside. And we're not worried about chloride or calcium right now. Here is the Nernst equation that allows you to calculate the equilibrium potential for any ion. The only thing you would have to know is what is the ratio of the uh, that particular ion of interest outside or inside. Let's use sodium real quick as an example. The ratio of sodium outside to inside is approximately 10 to 1. So let's just simplify the numbers here, make our life easy. Let's say 10 to 1 outside to inside. Well, 10 divided by 1 is 10. The logarithm of 10 is 10 to the 1 is 1. So 61 divided by the valence of um, sodium, Z, is plus 1. So 61 divided by 1 is 61 times the logarithm of 10 to the 1, which is 1. So the equilibrium potential will come out for sodium to be given the numbers that I'm using here, the simplified ones, that would be EX would be plus 61 millivolts. And since it's plus 66, pretty close. But just to give you an idea of how this works. And here are the numbers calculated. So here, if you want to use the real numbers, um, then you will find these um, uh, equilibrium potentials based on the Nernst equation. And here's the Goldman-Hodgkin-Katz equation that predicts the membrane potential when you're taking all ions into consideration.